So my name is Eugene Dunphy. I'm a retired music teacher. Um, just uh, by way of an introduction as to how I came about or came to learn about Carl Hardebeck. About 2009, I was conducting some research into the life and times of the Tyrone-born harper, Arthur O'Neill, who died in 1816. And when I was reading a little piece of research from a newspaper, I came across a reference to O'Neill, who was blind, and this other man who, um, who lived in Belfast for a while, and his name was Carl Gilbert Hardebeck, who also was blind. So this sent me on a, a, partic a particular trajectory, I suppose, because both were uh, almost fanatical about Irish music and about getting the, the, the beauty of the music um, the story of the beauty of the music related to other people, not only in Ireland but throughout the world. <clears throat> now, when it comes to Hardebeck, the talk I'll be given won't really make much sense unless I say something about Braille. Now, Braille is a way of writing and reading, as you probably know, invented by Louis Braille a few hundred years ago, Frenchman. So uh, I'll show you basically how Hardebeck notated songs when he went to the Gale Tucked, when he would go to Ranafarish, the Gidor, when he would go down to Anrin. So this is a mock-up copy of, uh, of how he would have done it. First of all, you needed a few things. You needed a braille board to support, uh, to act as a writing frame really, with a clip on it, a piece of paper, which would clip on to the board like so, and you also needed two very important constituent parts as well. The first being, this is only a mock-up made out of cardboard, but in Hardebeck's day this would have been made out of metal, mostly metal. This is called a braille frame, also known as a braille slit. You can see a series of rectangular holes punched in that. Each hole is known as a braille cell. And when you're writing in each cell, whether it be a word or a letter, you pierce a series of holes, one to six. Six is the maximum, one is the minimum for each cell. And depending on what point to, um, that would represent a letter. Also, it would represent a word. So for example, uh, if, if I use this little stylus and press through one of the braille cells to the top right hand corner of a braille cell, when you read that back with your fingertips, that would represent the letter A, only the letter A. It also would represent a contraction, but that's too difficult to get into at the moment. It's also too convoluted. So we'll just stick to letters for the moment. So here we have the braille frame, which would be then, you would lift your piece of paper, the braille frame would be slid the top of the, the paper and the braille board using a stylus, and again I don't have a stylus. Now what's a stylus? It's basically a pen, rather than a nib, you have a point in it. In this case I have a pen, this is my stylus. So you would use the stylus, and you would, for example, I'm just going into the top right hand corner here. That's the letter A. I'd move on, and if I want to get the letter B, etc., 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 all the, the various per permutations. Now, say I com completed a sentence, I would remove the frame, I would remove the sheet from the braille board. I then would have to turn over the page because I've just written there from right to left, you probably noticed. But in order to write what I've written, I would run my fingers along and I came across, I can feel now one permutation on the page which represents the letter A. Then there's a slight space, then there's two permutations, that's the letter B, etc, etc. So that's how you would read Read, read and write braille. I hope that makes sense. So in the mid-1860s, 
a jeweler from the Osnabrück district of Germany, whose name was Karl Joseph Hardebeck, moved to England and set up a jewellery business in a place called Clerkenwell in London. A short time later, he married a girl from Devon whose name was Catherine Jones. And the couple soon set up home in Middleton Place in Clerkenwell. It was there at Middleton Place that their son, Carl Gilbert Hardebeck, was born on the 10th of December, 1869. Now, Carl Gilbert was rendered totally blind when he was just a child of three months old as a result of, and I quote, an inflammation of the eyes caused by getting cold. Now, when a young boy, he showed a particular flair for playing the piano. And he was born with that rare gift of being pitch perfect. Now, what that means essentially is this. Say you were to sing him a series of notes. Well, he, without consulting a piano or any other musical instrument, could correctly identify those notes for you, which is a, a rare ability and uh, one that I'm highly envious of. Okay, so in January 1880, uh, his parents enrolled young Carl at the Royal Normal College for the Blind in Upper Norwood in London. He graduated from the college in 1892 with a sheaf of diplomas in music and was skilled in reading and writing Braille. Now there's a, one system for reading, or sorry, writing and reading text in Braille, and there's another system for writing and reading uh, music in Braille. Well, he was very skilled at both disciplines, apparently. So apart from being fluent in Dutch and German, he also had a very good working knowledge of Latin and Greek. When he left college, his father furnished him with a handsome sum of money. The exact amount is not known. Now he hoped that young Carl, his son, would become a piano teacher or a piano tuner. But Carl had very different aspirations altogether. He wanted to do something very different. So, in 1893, now he's just left college for one year at this stage. 1893, he and a business partner, a fellow called William Henry Bustard, who was a London-born piano maker, worked in a piano factory. He, William Bustard, along with Hardebeck, moved to Belfast in 1893 and they opened a, a piano shop. It was known as a piano warehouse at 22 Wellington Place in the city. Now in the same year, 24-year-old Hardebeck married 25-year-old Mary Reavy, an Irish speaker from County Down who was then working as a dressmaker in Belfast. Now Mary was to play a significant role in introducing her husband to the Irish language and to Irish music. And perhaps not surprisingly, within a short period of time, um, both Carl and Mary became members of Conran the Gaelic. For the next five years, the couple lived on the Old Lodge Road in Belfast um, with Mary's father, Charles. And then after a year or so, they moved to uh, the home of Mary's brother, Joseph, who lived just off the Limestone Road in Belfast. However, there was a problem with the business. After a few years, it became increasingly evident that Bustard was, let's say, um, secreting funds from the business practice. So the business went bankrupt as a direct result of William Henry Bustard's business malpractice. So the music shop went bankrupt in 1896. Now after 1896, Buster sort of disappears from the records. There's not, there's not a word from him. He's untraceable. Um, so how much he left with, we don't know. So Hardebeck's in Belfast. He's without a job. Music business has failed. But in 1897, he gets a new job as resident organist at the Holy Family Chapel on the Limestone Road. In the same year, Hoping to win a prize at the Fesh Kjol in Dublin, he submits two self-composed hymns composed for or, or composed and arranged for organ and voice. Both win first prize. And for the next eleven years, 
he applies himself, he, he wins a series of prizes at the face kill, first prizes mostly. But over that amount of time, as a result, I, I would say as a direct result of uh, Mary's influence, he applies himself to an in-depth study of the language, the music, the poetry, and the history of Ireland over the next 11 years. Now, St. Patrick's Day 1900 was a seminal day in his life. He had something of a life-changing uh, experience in that day. That was the day he attended uh, a St. Patrick's Day concert organised by the Gaelic League at the Ulster Hall in Belfast. Introduced onto the stage was a traditional singer by the name of Marcino Conlon. I think he may have been a monster band. <clears throat> but Marcin sang a series of Irish language songs. Hardebeck was absolutely smitten from that day onwards by the sounds, the rhythms, the melodies. He later said, This language sounds so beautiful, it surely must be spoken by the angels of heaven. Soon after, he packed his braille board frame, paper and stylus into a case and travelled with his wife Mary to the Donegal Kale Tuck where he said, I collected all the songs I could, I gathered them eagerly and I studied them minutely. According to his friend Sean O'Boyle, the arrival of a tall bald man wearing a pair of dark glasses caused a certain level of curiosity, let's say, in the Gale Tuck. He soon became known around Gidor and Ranafarsta as the far more doll, the big blind man. Sean O'Bwell, I'll just uh, relate a little quote from O'Bwell, who remembered. Hardebeck came among them looking for songs, when Irish speakers were looked upon as the odd survivors of an ancient barbarism. He would come in on the arm of his guide, stooping low through the door with a Gaelic salutation from O'Growney on his lips and permit himself to be led slowly across to the chimney corner. There he would take out his braille board, frame and stylus and ask the singer of the house to oblige him with a song. The imagery of that for me, it does something to my soul. Uh, there we have this blind man who's besotted by what he's just heard in the, the Ulster Hall in Belfast. Now he's going to Donegal and he's surrounded by the Irish language in the various houses that he goes to. There are people singing to him in Irish. Now West Belfast man Sean Neeson and his Cork-born fiancée, a girl called Geraldine O'Sullivan, both musicians, observed Hardebeck's structured attention to detail when notating his songs in Braille. Geraldine said that he notated them as fast as the musicians performed them. It was fascinating to watch him do this, she said. Those tobacco stained fingers moving so neatly across the page and very rarely was there any need for correction. Note values, ornaments and variations were all caught with complete accuracy. Okay, so what, what particularly attracted him, this blind man, to traditional music? Well, the melodies that accompanied the song words were often modal. Right. <clears throat> we can get into a whole sort of treatise as to what modalities are. But put simply, I suppose, a lot of traditional melodies have a lot in common with Gregorian chant, in that they feature these, I suppose, musicians, classically trained musicians who are not particularly au fait with traditional music would describe them as rogue notes. In other words, they're slightly jarring, but they're modal notes. Now, in the English language, I suppose, an example of this, now forgive me, I feel as if I'm going to break into song, but an example of this would be um, Schlieve Gallen Bray. As <clears throat> I went a walking one morning in May 
to view the fair valleys and mountains so gay. I was thinking, that note there on the word thinking, that's one of those rogue notes. That's a modal note. You very rarely, once in every eclipse, would you get that in classical music. Another example would be, where lagon streams flow gently along. Bang on the money with another rogue modal note there. Now, some musicians believe that they had a place in traditional music. We'll grant you that. But maybe it's, maybe it's antiquated. Maybe there's no room for it. But to Hardebeck's pitch perfect ears, these modal notes were what attracted him to traditional music. They were beautiful, you know, and he wanted to make sure, he was, he was asking himself, why aren't these published? So he asked around, obviously these songs are published in various collections. Inevitably he was told, not really, maybe one or two books. So he decided to do something about that. But first, he encountered another problem. He soon found that the Braille system that he had learned in London at the Royal Normal College, that was all fine and well for the English language, but it was not at all suited to the Irish language. Now he overcame this problem because he was left undaunted by most things. He overcame this problem by rejigging and reconfiguring the braille system that he had learned in London. And he came up with his own. He came up with the system to write the Irish language in braille. But for example, you know, he would put in the likes of, to connote a fada, for example, uh, the fada A, he would use uh, the top two dots, one of the middle dots, and the two dots at the bottom. And he would also have symbols to connote a bulcha in, uh, above, above, for example, a, a letter B, letter F, G, etc., etc. So we'll I'd like to come back to that, uh, the Braille system that he invented uh, a little while later. Uh, Hardebeck's Braille system is still in use today, but it's undergone quite a, a dramatic transformation. But having said that, it's, it's, it, it, it is still, still in use. In September 1900, Carl and Mary Hardebeck got a house next door to the Holy Family Chapel, which was handy enough because that's where Hardebeck was working, in the Limestone Road, in the Holy Family Chapel. <clears throat> From his house he taught piano, singing, and set about arranging for piano some of the songs he had collected in the Gale Tucked. Three of his young Belfast pupils, Sean Neeson, Shad Well and Seamus O'Doherty were later to become ambassadors for his music, Neeson and O'Well in Ireland and Seamus O'Doherty in New York. O'Doherty did a lot to promote his music in New York. 1902 then, so in 1902, Hardebeck befriended Parig Pierce. Now we know that Pierce visited Hardebeck's Limestone Road home on at least one occasion. Now Pierce asked the far more dal to arrange six Gaelic songs for him. Now they were published by the Gaelic League in Dublin between 1902 and 1903 under the generic title Ceatha Coil, which is Showers of Music. So in 1904, Hardebeck took up a new appointment as organist at St. Peter's Pro Cathedral in West Belfast, a position he was to hold until 1919. By that time, his knowledge of the Irish language was so good, he was appointed teacher of traditional singing at Creave Rua, the headquarters of Conrad and the Gaelga, which was based down in Murray's Terrace in central Belfast. Unable to find a publisher interested in his collection of Gaelic songs, in 1908, he published his first volume of Shoda Kjol, Gems of Melody, a book which was warmly welcomed by most of the members, I'd say all of the members, because I never got a, I never read a negative response within the Gaelic League in Belfast. 1911 11 saw the publication of Shadokyola 
at all. And then uh, in 1915, we showed a call at three. So in acknowledgement of his achievements, Conrad and Gaelica made him president of their newly established traditional song society called Common Cure. So what exactly did Hardebeck think about the Irish language? Well, I suppose it's best summed up by this quote. During the course of one of his lectures in Belfast, he said, I am not an Irishman, but I would like to say a few words about the importance of the language to the country. So long as we use a language spoken by another people, we are only a nation of imitators. So it's a case of get off the fence, why don't you? So around about 1911, he held a series of traditional singing classes at Art School Ultock in West Belfast, where one of his pupils was Nora Connolly, daughter of James. But in the winter of 1913, Hardebeck's wife fell seriously ill. Mary died in January 1914 and was buried at Milltown Cemetery, Belfast. Her husband, if truth be told, was absolutely heartbroken by her passing. A short time later, he received a letter of condolence from uh, Pierce. Now, a few years ago, just by way of an aside to that story, um, I knew that she was buried in Milltown Cemetery. My, myself and my wife decided to do a little bit of searching. So we went over to Milltown and uh, after a lot of uh, searching around, we finally uncovered her grave. There was a Celtic cross originally, obviously, that stood up on the pedestal, but it had cracked, probably weathered, and it had fallen into the grave. And the entire plot was covered in a thick blanket of ivy. So we were delighted to, uh, to, uh, to uncover that. And it was, it was quite an emotional time, actually. But anyway, but Hardebeck been a blind man. He needed a guide. He needed a companion. And also, um, he was a likable man. So in June, <laughs> June 1915, he married again. His new wife being Mary Raphael McKenna, a 39-year-old school teacher from West Belfast. Uh, it's okay talking the, about the, his high and mighty uh, works and work for Braille and traveling to the Gale Talk and doing all these wonderful, um, virtuous things. But those who knew Hardebeck remembered him as someone who enjoyed the odd drink and the odd smoke. As someone blessed with an impish sense of humor, as someone not easily impressed with ecclesiastical pomp and ceremony. He didn't have much time for it, basically. Here's an example. In May 1918, just after he heard about the execution of Pierce, he was playing the organ up in the gallery there at St. Peter's, and uh, by way of a recessional hymn, he played Aron the Vane at full blast, which must have uh, raised a few eyebrows. But anyway, he expressed a strange trinity of beliefs to Sean O'Boyle. And I quote Dorche, I believe in God, I believe in Beethoven, and I believe in Parig Pierce. That would stick with him for the rest of his days. He never denied it. He was very proud of making that statement. So in uh, 1904, Carl uh, Hardebeck was seconded from the Holy Family Chapel where he was an organist. Holy Family on the Limestone Road in Belfast, seconded from there to the church behind us, St. Peter's, in 1904. Now he fulfilled two roles while he, while he was here, the first being resident organist and the second uh, role was as campanologist or bell ringer. Now there's a great story of him walking from the Limestone Road. He, he preferred walking rather than taking a car or a cart. but. Um, as he, was, as he was walking along with his stick, dark glasses, on the hand of his guide over to the church, he was accosted by a few uh, local uh, boyos, uh, one of them who said, and I quote, well, I'll paraphrase more than quote, he said, there's that, fien there's that blind person who rings them Fenian bells, but I don't think he used the word person. 
But anyway, while uh, Carl Hardebeck was here, um, he met with Father Charlie O'Neill, a great uh, lover of the GAA and lover of the Irish language from Portland Own County Antrim. Now Charlie O'Neill in January 1919 goes to attend the first sitting of Dáil Éireann in Dublin and he's so moved by the proceedings and what he heard and what he saw that he composed The Foggy Dew, a classic song. Um, it was released, uh, the, the, the music, uh, the words were written of course by him um, the melody wasn't written by him. There was, there was already a song called The Foggy Dew, so he used the old melody of The Foggy Dew to write new words and compose new words for it. And it was published in Dublin, but there was a problem. The piano arrangement wasn't that good. So O'Neill had an idea and he approached Hardebeck here in St. Peter's and he asked Hardebeck, would he consider doing a, a piano arrangement? And Hardebeck said, I would because he was particularly attracted by the lyric. Now at the very start of that, that song, um, there is a series of nine block chords and they, they sound quite clashing, quite dissonant, if you like, to the, 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 the average ear. And people were asking, why did he put those in? They don't, they don't sound particularly correct. But the reason he put those in was to mimic the frequencies of the Angelus bell that rang at the start of the rising uh, Easter morning in Dublin. So that's the reason he put, he put those, uh, those block chords in. So after he did that arrangement of the Foggy Jew, the song actually took off. And within six months, it was been sung the length and breadth of, Ar of Ireland from Antrim right down to Cork. So the month is May, the year is 1916. Hardebeck is sitting at the organ on Sunday Mass, which is Low Sunday, May 1916. He's just heard within the last few days that Pierce has been executed in Dublin. So what does he do? He waits for the end of the Mass. The priest gives his final solemn blessing and Hardebeck then plays as a recessional hymn, Aran Navian, at full volume. You know, it is amazing for me being here because after a few years doing research into Hardebeck's life, you sort of feel as if you know the fella. Um, the organ that we're standing beside here, the significance of that culturally is absolutely immense and I can sort of feel the man's spirit here as we speak. Um, looking down at, the, at the, the church and the palatial ceiling, um, th it must have been spectacular, a spectacular sound that the people heard when that man played the organ because apparently his artistry at the instrument and piano was exceptional. Anyone who knew him pointed that out and plus the fact he was pitch perfect which means that he was born with that rare gift of being able to identify a note. So if you sang without consulting a piano, so if you sang him a note or a series of notes he'd be able to correctly identify the names of the notes without consulting any musical instrument, which is a rare gift, something that I would dearly love to have, but alas, it, is, it has escaped me. We'll go back a few years in time. So we're, we're now on the 1919. Well, a few years prior to that, 1915, Hardebeck got a visit from a man in Cork, a priest in Cork whose name was Father Christy O'Flynn. Now, Christy O'Flynn had heard story after story about this fella who's given lectures about the place, this blind fella who's extremely talented. He's published these books, etc. I'd like to meet him. So O'Flynn, travels to Belfast in 1915 and meets Hardebeck. But O'Flynn just doesn't want to meet him to hero worship. 
O'Flynn has got a proposition for him. O'Flynn presents this scenario to him. He said, the way things are going, it looks the political landscape is going to change in this country over the next few years. If and when it does, would you be interested in this proposition? Would you be interested in coming down to Cork to become a headmaster of our school of music? Harbeck said, leave it with me. 1918, three years later then, Sinn Féin sweep the boards at the elections. Christy O'Flynn down in Cork sees this as his perfect opportunity to approach Hardebeck. He approaches him again and he says, listen, the way things are going now, it looks as if we'll be able to secure the School of Music, to have a transformation of what's happening there, to make it more Irish Ireland rather than Irish pretend to be Ireland England. Would you be interested in coming down and transforming this place in Cork for us? And Hardebeck said, I will. So in 1919, he resigned from St. Peter's and he travels down to Cork. Of course, word had spread that there was a boy with a German sounding name coming down from the north to open a school of Irish music and he's going to be a headmaster, a guy with a German sounding name. Now, the war had just ended then, a few months anyway. And uh, there was an organisation in Cork which was quite uh, powerful called the Discharged and Demobilised Sailors and Soldiers Federation. Quite a mouthful, I know. But what they did was they organised a series of protests in the city with um, lots of um, not particularly nice signs saying Huns out, German is out, etc. etc. They also frequently um, broke into the school and uh, threatened teachers and staff etc. Harlebeck was totally undaunted by this. He said listen my job is to become a headmaster here. Here's what I'm going to do he said at a meeting of the teachers. Since I'm the headmaster here now it's like this lads. If you want to remain at this school you got to do two things. First of all, you've got to learn Irish. Second of all, you have to conduct all your classes through Irish. Well, that led to a few resignations, a walkout. A few, a few of the teachers stayed, of course, and followed his wishes. Father O'Flynn was sitting back in his chair and loving this. And of course, Hardenbeck didn't mind because he said, that's what you asked me down to Cork for you know, to make an Irish school of music where the, the main language is th it's through Gaelic. That's why I'm here. All I'm doing is just fulfilling your wishes. So as headmaster, Hardebeck insisted that the teachers at the school of music learn Irish so they could conduct their classes through Irish. And when not teaching, he spent a lot of time arranging songs uh, for school children, which were then published in a series of pamphlets and books. But between lack of funding, ongoing protests and the onset of the Civil War, Hardebeck finally became disillusioned with the city and decided to leave. My wife is heartily sick of this place, he wrote, and will not spend another winter lodging in Cork. So in 1923, himself and Mary Raphael packed their bags and head north back to Belfast. So they set up home at above small shoes shop in Divis Street and at the request of some members of the Gaelic League, in particular a man, in particular a man called Ambrose Serridge who owned a bookshop down in the city centre, Ambrose Serridge and a few others suggested to Harlebeck, they asked him, listen would you be interested in writing a book, a biography of your life and he said not particularly. Well would you be interested in writing a uh, a history of Irish music and he rubbed his hands in glee and he says now you're talking. So he spent three years writing the history of Irish music in Braille. Took him three years to complete. That really was a magnum opus. And 
<clears throat> the intention was was to, to send the manuscript off to Dublin so just to make it a wee bit more accessible to the publishers the Braille manuscript was transcribed into standard text sent off to Dublin after about 10 years searching I haven't been able to find either the Braille manuscript or the, the textual manuscript which is a, a crying shame uh, for me it would be like winning the lottery to, to see something like that I don't want it I just want to see it um, Hardebeck's field work it wasn't confined just to Belfast and Cork um, his reputation at this stage had spread throughout the length and breadth of the country and uh, in Dublin there were two guys Irish speakers Irish language enthusiasts one was called Colm O'Loughlin who was a publisher and uh, also a, a singer with a Gaelic choir in Dublin called Anclashgittle and another man who had a great admiration for Hardebeck as well was Fanan McCollum. Now, who was he? McCollum had strong Cork connections, and while Hardebeck was in Cork, McCollum was providing them with songs that he had collected in order for the far more Dal to arrange them. So McCollum and O'Loughlin are now based in Dublin, and they come up with an idea. They think, right, this could work. Now there was a rift happening at that time within the Gaelic League in Belfast, falling out. So the first item on the agenda was the split, unfortunately. So the Gaelic League had a bit of a falling out. O'Loughlin knew this. Hardebeck was a bit disillusioned. He thought, listen, I'm back in Belfast now and you're falling out among yourselves. Is there any end to this? O'Loughlin sees a wee bit of a... He's got an optimistic sight uh, a vision for the future and he asked Hardebeck listen would you be interested in coming down to Dublin we're going to start a school of music another one in Cork failed we'll try it again myself and McCollum now it's interesting that Colm O'Loughlin's father and was a publisher and O'Loughlin's father published the Foggy Jew way back then 1919 so O'Loughlin knew about Hardebeck's reputation already, it was long established. O'Loughlin and McCollum invite him down, Hardebeck says yes. Now why did they invite him down? For two reasons. Number one, they wanted the Department of Education within Dáil Éireann to invite him to Dublin and pay him for all the work that he was doing for Irish music because he had this vast collection of material that he needed to work on and publish. The second reason they wanted him down was O'Loughlin and McCollum uh, thought, well, OK, if he starts this work and gets paid for it, it's only a matter of time before the Department of Education within Dáil Éireann appoint him as a principal of a new national school of Irish music in Dublin, a new national school, none of this sort of localised thing, new national school of Irish music in Dublin. So that's how they respected him and that's how they thought that his, he should be thanked for his work that he had given to the country. So in the summer of 1931, Hardebeck leaves Belfast, goes to Dublin and he gives a, a series of lectures. January 1932, just a few months later, he gets a job as a part-time teacher of Gaelic song at the Dublin Municipal School of Music. Now, it only lasts for about a year. And the optimistic and Clash Goodell hoped, well, since he's given that series of lectures, this is going to encourage now uh, the doll to actually open this school of music with him, at Hardebeck, as its head, head man. But in the ensuing months and years, and much to the disappointment of Inclashgadal, of O'Loughlin, of McCullum, it became increasingly obvious that Rowan and Aedicus, the Department of Education within Dáil had absolutely no intention, A, of paying him, and B, 
opening a national school of music and C, <laughs> forget about a headmaster because we're not going to have a school of music. And also, you know this thing about Gaelic song? A lot of them were thinking this at the time. Actually, we're, we, we, well, it's not that we're a slight bit more. We're more interested in the Anglo-Irish music of Thomas Moore. He's world renowned. So we would like to sort of, if we're going to have to expand energy, we'd rather expand it on promoting the music of Thomas Moore rather than this Gaelic song stuff. Sure, that's all passe now. Which is just unfortunate. But anyway, Anclashgadal, members of Anclashgadal realised Dol Aaron are not paying them. They're not interested in opening a school of music. They're not interested in publishing Gaelic songs. But the problem was, how is Hardabit going to survive? So in classical organised a, a series of concerts around Dublin and that enabled the far more Dal to pay his gas bills, his food bills, you know, and get a, and his rent and a, an odd cigarette and a, well he smoked a pipe and an odd wee whiskey. But anyway, the last day of February 1933, his second wife, Mary Raphael died at Our Lady's Hospital in Dublin. It looks as of natural causes. I think it may have been something bronchial related. So with her husband unable to afford a headstone for her grave, she was laid to rest in a unmarked grave in Milltown, Belfast. And again, uh, not wanting to be without a companion and a guide, one year later, Hardebeck married again his third wife being Mary Elizabeth Handybode from the north side of Dublin. And by this time, of course, uh, forget about Dal Aaron, that idea of the School of Music, just forget about that notion. But in Dublin at that time, there was a blind man called J.P. Neary. And who was he? Well, he was an Irish language speaker, and he also was the head of uh, an organisation which was based in Great George's Street, Dublin, called the Irish Association for the Blind. J.P. Neary and Hardebeck were kindred spirits. They, ha they were of the same mindset and they sang of the same hymn sheet in Braille, albeit. So the two of them put their heads together and they asked themselves, listen, how about we do this? Um, it's just an, just an idea. We have all these books, we're flooded with these braille books in Ireland at the moment for the blind. But you know, who wants to read about Shakespeare? Shakespeare's all fine and well, but wouldn't it be great to get to transcribe Irish novelists, Irish dictionaries, the works of O'Growney, for example, into braille? Hardebeck said, I think that'd be a brilliant idea. And Neary says, are you sure? And Hardebeck says, yes. It's nearly says, well, the reason I asked you is because I thought you would agree because we're going to use your Gaelic Braille system. Hardebeck says, all fine and well with me. So using the print presses in, in the Irish Association for the Blind Offices in Great George's Street, Dublin, the printing presses were working night and day, chugging out these large volumes of old grounies dictionaries in Braille, of Antillanoch by O'Cannon, of all these Irish language works in Braille. So the, the, the blind Irish speakers or those who are learning Irish could read all these wonderful works so they had the language at their fingertips, so to speak. So in the early 1940s, Hardebeck continued to arrange more Gaelic songs for the Dolls publishing wing called Angum, but he wasn't getting any payment for it but it didn't detract him. Because those who knew him said he wasn't in it for the money. He never was in it for the money. If he, wanted, if he, was, in it, if he was in something like this for the money, if he was in anything for the money, if he was attracted by it, he would have stayed 
uh, taken the inheritance that he got from his father, stayed in London, or even opened a business in Belfast. If it collapsed, all fine and well, but just sit back, take early retirement, and enjoy the fruits of a, a, a very lucrative inheritance. But at this stage in his life, in the 1940s, he was absolutely broke because the expenditure that went into this, this printing and, and uh, the publishing, self-publishing and all, that's, that's where his money went, essentially, you know, just to get the, promote the language, promote the music. Now, there was a, a group of um, priests in Dublin, Capuchins, um, who learned about his plight. So in 1944, they organized a series of concerts. They also contacted their um, friends in New York and a few concerts were held and the Capuchins collected this money and passed it on to Hardebeck, uh, who was now, by 1944, a very frail um, man. He died on the 10th of February 1945 and was buried in an unmarked grave in Glasnevin. And it wasn't until 1963 that a headstone was placed over his grave, courtesy of those wee boys who went to music classes with him, Sean Neeson, Sean O'Boyle and others. And they erected a headstone over his grave, as I say, with an inscription in Irish and English. Now, it's, I'll say something now about his legacy before I, I wrap up. Uh, to mark the 25th anniversary in February 1970, um, a celebration of Hardebeck's life in music was staged in Belfast. Father Brendan McMwelan, nephew of one of Hardebeck's friends in Belfast, Sean McMwelan, was one of the driving forces behind this week-long commemoration. According to a brochure uh, printed at that time, one of the singers who contributed to the week-long event was uh, uh, the legendary Albert Fry, who apparently sang some wonderful songs. Now, over 40 years later, I had the privilege of meeting Father Brendan and his brother, Father Kevin McMillan, both of whom very kindly uh, gave me their entire library of Ardebeck's music and a few other things besides books, etc., which is absolutely amazing. So the enthusiasm shown that I detected from the two brothers for his legacy inspired me to uh, put up a wee plaque, uh, which was installed in 2013 at the Holy Family Chapel, where, uh, where Hardebeck was the first an organist before he came to St. Peter's. Now, based on my research to date, I reckon that there's between, th that he published between 330 to 340 pieces of music. That's Gaelic songs, Anglo-Irish music, um, masses, uh, etc. Pieces arranged for organ. And a while ago I finished uh, writing a book on his life and it's currently been edited in Cork. Now before I go, and I would <laughs> I would like to say this because I mean it as the politicians say from the bottom of my heart, but it is true in this case. While I was do conducting research for the book, I was helped, and I, I don't know where he got the energy from, he certainly had an awful lot more energy than I had. I was helped so much by the late Sean McAndrasa, who did so much for me in translating pieces from letters from English to Irish, articles from English to Irish. He, he was actually hunting down these articles that I'd never seen before. Um, so wherever you are, Sean, uh, God be good to you. So that's about all and I hope you enjoyed this, this talk and I didn't bore you and I'm as bad as my father. I have only 40 verses and I won't detain you long, but that's all for me. Thank you.